I would like to start <clears throat> by pointing out that I'm an auditory neuroscientist, and I love the auditory system, but uh, I want to put it into the context of other sensory systems. Uh, because after all, the auditory system is just one of many sensory systems that humans and other animals have. Um, if you look at lowly animals, uh, as lowly as an earthworm, or spiders, or uh, insects of all types, they also have multiple sensory systems. So it's a plan that's kind of a, an animal plan to have not just one, but many sensory systems. And so <clears throat> why do we have so many sensory systems? Uh, we have five that are illustrated here. We actually have many more than those five. And of course, each one of these sensory systems allows us to interact with the world in a different way because every sensory system uh, samples energy from the environment in a different way, a different kind of energy, and it provides us with information we need in order to um, survive in this world and to derive enjoyment. So <clears throat> to get an appreciation of how different sensory systems offer a different view of the world and also how they kind of work together to uh, provide an integrated uh, view, we might look at uh, vision versus the auditory system, hearing. And if we look at vision, uh, what our eyes are responding to is a narrow range of electromagnetic energy that we call light. And the way the visual system works, uh, it's pretty direct and it's limited because if you think about it, you can only see what you're directly looking at. You can't see through walls, you can't see around corners, uh, you can't see behind you unless you're a, a, a mother. And uh, if you close your eyes or you turn off the lights, you no longer can see, you're blind. Contrast that with the hearing system where the stimulus is mechanical energy in the form of sound and um, unlike the visual system where we have to be attending in order to see something the auditory system is working constantly you can't turn it off and so we can hear through walls and we can hear behind us and we can hear around corners and then if we find ourselves in the dark our auditory system is still working our ears monitor the environment constantly, even if we're asleep. And so given the way that the auditory system works, it's no surprise that things that make sounds are used to get our attention. So I've got a couple of examples here of things that make attention-getting sounds, and these happen to be some sounds I don't particularly like. And then I can contrast that with other sounds that I really love. Uh, for example, the sounds of music played on a Steinway grand piano, or the laughter and the voices of my little girls. Uh, those are sounds that I really, really love. And all of these sounds are just part of our daily life. They're part of the fabric of our, our daily life. And when I think about hearing, I kind of think about it in terms of uh, health. It's like health. As long as everything's working well, you take it for granted. And it's only once something starts to go wrong that you realize just how important those things were. And so I'd like to um, start by talking about how hearing normally works. So we're going to talk about the normal auditory system. And then after we see how the normal system works, then we can take a look at uh, some causes and consequences of hearing loss. And so this is where hearing starts, with this skin-covered flap hanging on the sides of our heads. And this is called the pinna, or the oracle. And you can see on this side that there's actually many parts to the pinna. And each one of these ridges actually plays a role in uh, the ability to localize sounds in space. The pinna has uh, many functions. 
including some non-auditory functions. Uh, in addition to being adorned, we can put some glasses on our ears. The auditory function is mainly to collect sounds and then funnel them down a little tube. So um, I asked my girls the other day, I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old girl, and I said, um, how does hearing work? And they said, oh, well, um, you use your ear. And so for my girls, uh, this is not only where hearing starts, this is where hearing ends. But of course, we know that there's more to the ear than meets the eye. And so this slide is depicting the entire auditory system, which we can break down into two main divisions. First, we have the peripheral auditory system, which is commonly called the ear. Uh, this is the part of the ear that works kind of like a microphone. It's a mechanoelectrical device. And so the function of the peripheral auditory system is to take in sound. It'll amplify and filter some frequencies of sound selectively. And then it'll pass it through to this region, the cochlea, where transduction occurs. And that's where a, a movement energy gets transduced into electrical energy. And then the electrical signals that are generated by cells in this organ will be conveyed to the brain via this big cable of nerve fibers. That cable is the auditory nerve. And it's at that point that the uh, magic occurs because the next part of the auditory system is the central auditory system. And this truly is the organ of hearing. Uh, we've got uh, groups of neurons in the brainstem and in the thalamus and the cortex. Each one of those groups of nuclei, uh, they perform a different kind of analysis of sound. And so at the end, uh, we have the perceptual function we hear. Now, when we talk about uh, hearing and hearing loss, we tend to focus on the peripheral auditory system even though the central auditory system is the true organ of hearing. And I think that makes sense because if you think of the uh, peripheral auditory system as being the microphone of the system, if something's wrong with the microphone, then the signal that you deliver to the brain is going to be degraded. And so we have to ensure that the signal reaching the brain is clear and high fidelity. And so uh, hearing loss, occurs here most commonly because that part of the auditory system is uh, pretty easily damaged. And so now we're going to focus in on that peripheral auditory system. And here's a view that includes the uh, four parts. So let me point out the four parts of the peripheral auditory system and talk a little bit about what each one of those parts does. The first part is called the outer ear. Uh, we've seen part of it already, and that's the pinna on the outside of the head. And that's continuous with a little tube, the external ear canal. And the purpose of this device is to collect sound. Uh, it funnels down the canal, and some frequencies are amplified in the process. Uh, the frequencies that are amplified are frequencies that are at the resonant frequency of this tube. And so it's like a musical instrument. Uh, it has a, a particular frequency that it's going to enhance because of its physical properties. The next part is called the middle ear. And the middle ear is this uh, air-filled space. In the bone, this is the uh, temporal bone, the hardest bone in your body. And this air-filled space is a chamber that houses three tiny bones, the tiniest bones in the body. And these three tiny bones are linked together to form an ossicular chain. And the function of this chain is to amplify sound as we go from the air to the fluid inside of the cochlea. If we didn't have this structure here, then when air strikes the fluid of the cochlea, 
99.9% .9 of the energy is going to be reflected back and lost. And so to prevent that loss of energy, the middle ear acts as a, as a, a transformer and an impedance matching device so that energy can be transferred uh, from the eardrum to, to the fluid of the cochlea. All right, so dividing the external ear from the middle ear is a tympanic membrane, also called the eardrum. And this is going to vibrate faithfully in response to the sound that strikes it. And then the ossicular chain is going to move in unison and the stapes is going to pump in and out like a piston into the oval window of the next part, which is the cochlea. Uh, the cochlea is the hearing portion of the inner ear. It's this snail-shaped, coiled, bony structure. The other half of the inner ear has the uh, semicircular canals, and that part of the ear has the responsibility of our sense of balance. So angular motion, angular acceleration, and balance. So inside of this bony cochlea, we have some specialized cells called hair cells. And it's the hair cells inside the cochlea that are going to change the energy of movement into electrochemical energy that drives neurons that they synapse with. And that brings us to the fourth part of the peripheral auditory system, which is a group of neurons called the spiral ganglion neurons that live just right outside of the cochlea and their axons form the auditory nerve that carries information from the ear to the brain. Our next picture here um, again is showing the peripheral auditory system. This time the cochlea is made transparent so that you can see that spiraling through the middle of the cochlea we have a bony shelf and on that bony shelf is a specialized epithelial layer called the organ of cordy. Here's a view of the organ of cordy. This is a section taken oh right about here and we're looking at it in cross section. And what we can see in this diagram are the two kinds of hair cells found in the organ of Cordy. We have on this side, the outside, three rows of cells that are called outer hair cells. And all along the cochlear duct, uh, if you add them up, count them, you're gonna find about 15,000 outer hair cells. The job of these cells is to control the gain or the sensitivity of a cochlear amplifier. And so these cells are not the sensory cells per se, they're cells that have a motor function. They actually change their shape in response to signals they receive from the brain. And in changing their shape, they change the gain or sensitivity of the cochlea. On the other side of this tunnel, we have a different kind of a hair cell called an inner hair cell. And it's inner hair cell because it's on the inner side. These cells form one row through the cochlea, and there's far fewer of them. There's about 3,500 inner hair cells total. You can see from this diagram that um, the nerve fibers are almost all synapsing with inner hair cells. Only a few fibers cross over through the tunnel to innervate outer hair cells. So most of the innervation in the cochlea is to inner hair cells. And for that reason, these inner hair cells are the ones that are responsible for transducing mechanical energy into chemical energy and the chemical is going to stimulate the nerve fibers, and these nerve fibers then are going to carry electrical impulses to the brain. So one way to think about these cells is they're responsible for the fidelity of a signal, whereas the outer hair cells are responsible for the sensitivity of the system. 
Here's an alternative view of the organ of Cordy. This time we're looking down at the surface of it. And this surface preparation has been stained with a particular stain that allows us to see metabolically active cells. And so I'm not sure if you can see um, from where you're sitting, but there are rows of outer hair cells on this side, three rows, and one row of inner hair cells on this side separated by a tunnel. And so this is an entirely normal looking cochlea, no hair cell loss. In addition to the hair cells, we also have the spiral ganglion neurons that live just outside of the organ of Cordy in a little canal called Rosenthal's Canal. And so each one of these little black circles is a neuron, a primary auditory neuron. And we also have in this bony ledge holes through which nerve fibers pass. Those nerve fibers are connecting the cell bodies to the inner hair cells. And so that's showing the peripheral processes of spiral ganglion cells. So everything here is normal. And uh, so a normal cochlea performs a certain function. Okay, so now that we have all the parts in place, uh, I'm gonna use this diagram to walk through what happens when we normally hear a sound. Uh, the cochlea here has been expanded so you can see that actually there are three chambers inside, three ducts and they're all filled with fluid. We have a paralymph chamber where the stapes pushes back and forth. We have the scala media where the hair cells are living, and then um, and we'll see what happens here when we have a sound. The sound I'm gonna use is one that we probably all had to hear this morning. Um, at least I did, and it was a horrible, horrible sound. Uh, here's our alarm clock. Whether you have a, a mechanical alarm clock or a digital alarm clock, something is moving in order to produce a sound. And so the sound waves that are produced by this clock are in the form of pressure waves with um, air molecules moving back and forth. And in the process of moving back and forth, uh, one group of air molecules bumps into the next group and they move back and forth and they bump and then it's a propagated wave. And so this wave is propagated in all directions from the source. It reaches the pinna, travels down the ear canal and strikes the eardrum. The eardrum moves back and forth. It vibrates at the same frequency as the sound waves that are hitting it. It's a very faithful transmission here. And because the three bones are connected to the tympanic membrane, they move back and forth as well. And so now we've got the stapes pushing in and out like a piston on the fluid of the cochlea. Fluid, of course, can't be compressed. So when the stapes moves in, that pushes down on the middle canal. And when it pulls back out, then the middle canal comes back up. And so as the stapes is moving in and out, the basilar membrane here in the middle canal is moving up and down. And so we've got a whole lot of motion going on here. Tympanic membrane moving back and forth, stapes moving in and out, fluid in the cochlea moving up and down that's going to stimulate the hair cells in a particular region. Now the cochlea is tuned according to frequency with high frequencies uh, being able to stimulate the organ of Cordy at the base and then progressively lower frequencies toward the apex. And so across this entire cochlea, we're representing the whole range of human hearing from about 20 hertz at the apex to about 20,000 hertz at the extreme base. 
And so I see that the organ of Cordy is being stimulated here, which tells me this is a high frequency sound. And that's actually one way that the brain is going to know that it's a high frequency sound is because this part of the basilar membrane and hence the auditory neurons in this region are the ones that are responding. So that's a simplified view of what happens normally when we hear. The next step is where the magic occurs, uh, all sorts of special things. Once the auditory nerve brings the information into the central auditory system. And so it's at that point, after a lot of processing, that we know about the sound. We know things like what the sound is. Ah, it's the alarm clock. And we know where it is because the brain has performed some really fancy computations where it's comparing the sound reaching the two ears. And so we know where the sound is coming from. And finally, uh, because of the cortical processing, we know what it means. We know what it means based on our past experiences with alarm clocks, and uh, we know from our memory that what it means is I've got to do something. I've got to destroy this alarm clock and go back to sleep. Okay, so that's the normal auditory system. And now we can talk about uh, some of the things that might go wrong to create a hearing loss. Basically, there's two different kinds of peripheral hearing loss. One is called conductive hearing loss. The other one is called sensory neural hearing loss. And the dividing line is just about here. Because anything that interferes with the transmission of sound from the outside of the ear all the way up to the stapes creates a conductive hearing loss. So here's, here's some ways I can make a conductive hearing loss. I can damage the outer ear. I can damage the pinna. I can plug up the ear canal. I can put some cotton in my ear canal or I can uh, block it with wax. I can poke a hole in the tympanic membrane. I can disarticulate this ossicular chain. Or I could fill this air space with fluid if I had something like a middle ear infection. And so each one of those examples would interfere with the transmission of sound. So that creates a hearing loss, but uh, frankly, it's not a huge deal because most conductive hearing losses are pretty easily resolved. Either surgery can be done, or you clean out your ear canal, or uh, the tympanic membrane heals itself, middle ear infections resolve, and hearing can be restored to normal. If it's not restored to normal, well, amplification works pretty well because what we have is a loss of sensitivity. On the other hand, if we have a hearing loss that involves the cells inside of the cochlea or the spiral ganglion neurons and their processes, we're in a different situation because those changes are permanent. Those are serious, permanent changes that we can't reverse. How many people have hearing loss? Um, actually, quite a few. And it turns out that hearing loss, among all of our sensory deficits, hearing loss is the most prevalent. And so I've got some data here from the US Census Bureau showing that compared to visual impairment, hearing impairment occurs about two and a half times more often. And so we're affecting a large number of people. This is a projection that by the year 2025, worldwide, over 900 million people will have a hearing loss of 25 dB or more. So hearing loss affects a huge number of people. 
Now, if you have normal hearing, that's terrific, but don't think you're out of the woods because all of us are at risk of developing acquired sensory neural hearing loss. And there's three main kinds that we have to be concerned about. In order of how many people are affected by these, uh, we have drug-induced hearing loss or ototoxicity. We have noise-induced hearing loss, NIHL. And finally, age-related hearing loss or presbycusis. Drug-induced hearing loss is um, a side effect of drugs that have ototoxic properties. Uh, certain doses, certain drugs can cause hearing loss by destroying the outer hair cells in the cochlea. Over 200 drugs are known to have ototoxic side effects. The uh, most common culprits that affect people are aminoglycoside antibiotics taken for infections and platinum-based drugs that are used for cancer treatment. Now, most of these uh, drugs are problematic when they're injected rather than when they're taken orally because the injection concentrates the dose inside of the inner ear. Noise-induced hearing loss is caused by exposure to damaging sounds. And so this could be one really loud sound, like an explosion or a gunshot, or it could be a lower level sound for a long period of time. So kids who are listening to their iPods at rather high levels for extended periods of time run a risk of developing noise-induced hearing loss. The National Institute of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, a branch of the NIH, has uh, estimated that currently we've got about 15% of Americans with noise-induced hearing loss. So that's somewhere on the order of 26 million people aged 20 to 69. And that includes about 2.3 million veterans who have hearing-related issues as a result of their uh, deployment in, in military zones. This next one is kind of an alarming new statistic. Uh, according to the NIDCD, up to about 16% of teens, these are kids aged 12 to 19, have reported some hearing loss that could be caused by loud noise. And so what we're seeing is a lot more noise-induced hearing loss as a result of personal um, music devices. Finally, we have presbycusis, and this is a progressive loss of hearing with age. I think um, the next one is showing good news and bad news together. So according to the NIDCD, about one-third of people between the ages of 65 and 74 years of age have presbycusis. And as we look at older individuals, age 75 and over, we're talking about half of those individuals. So it's affecting a lot of older individuals. On the other hand, look at how many people don't have age-related hearing loss. We've got two-thirds of people in this age range who, who have normal hearing. And so it is possible to reach old age without any loss of hearing. However, for those who do have a hearing loss, it's a major problem. It's currently ranked at uh, number three as the most prevalent health issue for the aged population um, after arthritis and heart disease. Now, each one of these kinds of hearing loss um, has unique features, but they also share a number of features, and so I'd like to go through some of these now. They have similar types of cochlear pathology. In all of these cases, the outer hair cells are the primary targets. Uh, it's well known that the outer hair cells are the accident-prone weaklings of the cochlea. So if you're going to damage cells in the cochlea, those outer hair cells are the ones that die first. 
And when we lose the outer hair cells, that's gonna impair the sensitivity and the resolution of the cochlea. Now in more severe cases, we get inner hair cell and spiral ganglion cell loss, and that's going to reduce the fidelity of the signal that's reaching the brain. And another basic feature is that, uh, for reasons we don't totally understand yet, cells in the base of the cochlea that respond to high frequency sounds are the ones that are lost first. And so to give you an idea what this looks like uh, for aging, here's a normal cochlea from a two-month-old mouse. This is in the base of the cochlea. Here we have the same region in an old mouse, and uh, you can readily see that inner hair cells are just fine, but there's a big loss of outer hair cells. So this mouse has a big high-frequency hearing loss. And if we look at the spiral ganglion cells, uh, between this young mouse and this old mouse, not a whole lot of difference. That doesn't mean the spiral ganglion cells are normal, though, because this next one shows that the number of nerve fibers that connect the inner hair cells to the spiral ganglion cells has decreased dramatically. Now, along with the cochlear hearing loss, the cochlear damage of high cell, of basal cell damage, uh, that's going to produce an audiogram that has hearing loss in the high frequencies. And so this is what an audiologist would find upon hearing testing. And this is an audiogram showing hearing level as a function of frequency. Hearing is pretty normal for low frequencies. It's not normal for the high frequencies because of the damage to the basal OHCs. This is for ototoxicity. We see similar audiograms for noise-induced hearing loss and for age-related hearing loss. All three kinds of hearing loss have similar perceptual consequences. So increased difficulty detecting sounds. And if there's inner hair cell loss, we also have impaired speech perception, especially when there's a noisy background. And so rather than trying to play this with sounds, I'm giving you a visual analog of what it's like to have a hearing loss. Here we have normal hearing, and this is what the auditory system normally does well we can pick out a signal readily against a background of noise. Things are pretty clear and sharp. But with outer hair cell loss, things start to get fuzzy and dimmer. And as outer hair cell loss progresses, it gets fuzzier and dimmer still. Now, once we add into that spiral ganglion cell and inner hair cell loss, we start to lose channels of information. And so the brain is getting a highly degraded signal to work with. We have similar psychosocial consequences. Uh, for example, people with hearing loss tend to feel more isolation, greater loneliness, their self-esteem is often lower, depression levels increase. Overall, there's just a reduced quality of life. And that's true for not just only severe and profound deafness, but for even mild hearing loss. Uh, even mild hearing loss up to about 40 dB can interfere with communication, and it's also been linked to earlier cognitive decline and increased risk of Alzheimer's disease and other neurological disorders. Now, this last commonality is actually where the good news lies. Um, all of these types of hearing loss have similar mechanisms of damage, and this damage is caused by reactive oxygen and, and nitrogen molecules, uh, molecules that um, are produced during cellular metabolism. Uh, they, form, they perform some useful some functions, but they can also cause damage if they're produced in really high quantities. And so normally, cells have means to prevent the damage from occurring in the form of antioxidants. Uh, this includes some enzymes such as superoxide dismutase, uh, glutathione, and uh, uh, GPX, uh, glutathione peroxidase. And these are going to neutralize and prevent damage from occurring Here's the model that we work with. Uh, according to this model, when there's an overproduction of these reactive molecules, 
or there's an underproduction or depletion of the antioxidants, then the balance favors the production of reactive molecules and oxidative stress, and that's going to lead to cell damage and hearing loss. And so wouldn't it be nice if we had some way to prevent hearing loss by maybe giving more antioxidants, by countering the reactive molecules? And so this balance hypothesis has been uh, tested and supported using a number of animal models. We've got uh, mice, which are great for studying age-related hearing loss because it sure is easier to study aging in a mouse over two years versus 80 years in a human. Uh, we have chinchillas that are great for noise-induced hearing loss studies because their range of hearing is so similar to humans. And uh, guinea pigs we've used for studies looking at the protective effects of vitamin C. And we specifically use guinea pigs for that because guinea pigs, like humans and unlike other animals, can't make their own vitamin C and they have to have it from their diet. Now all of the studies we've done have uh, supported two things. First of all, if we have treatments that increase reactive molecules or that deplete the antioxidants, we get more cochlear damage. And conversely, Treatments that increase antioxidant availability decrease cochlear damage and hearing loss. And that's nice, but all of those treatments have involved injections of things into animals, either systemic injections or injections directly into the ear. That's not very practical. So what we want to know is how we can increase an individual's general resistance to hearing loss in a practical way. And that's led us down the path of looking for dietary approaches to the prevention of hearing loss. And there are a number of dietary antioxidants that have been shown to be pre protective against hearing loss. Uh, vitamin E, in particular, when it's coupled with magnesium, reduces damage. Vitamin C, on its own, reduces damage. Um, Resveratrol in red wine reduces damage, and sulfur-containing compounds, uh, such as garlic here, will reduce damage. So that sounds great, doesn't it? All we have to do is increase our antioxidant intake, but mm, guess what? There's more to it than meets the eye, because you have to be careful. Here's the results of a study where we were giving alpha-lipoic acid to some mice to see if alpha-lipoic acid would decrease age-related hearing loss. And from this graph, it looks like it worked because the mice that got ALA had less high-frequency hearing loss than the control mice that had regular diets. But look what happens if we break it down according to sex. It turns out that the ones who benefited were males, and the female mice actually got more hearing loss. And so the picture is a little complicated, and as soon as we got these results, I stopped taking my alpha-lipoic acid <laughs> supplement. And the last study that I'm going to uh, tell you about is one that uh, uh, was just uh, completed by an undergraduate student working in my lab. Uh, Sarah Nielsen did this for her honors thesis. Thinking about things that you can eat to be protective, hey, what about dark chocolate? Dark chocolate has all sorts of really good compounds. It's got poly phenolic compounds, it's got flavonoids, it's got blood, uh, blood flow promoters, it's got stimulants in it. What, I bet this is the answer. So we tried this out with mice and we gave mice the opportunity to eat some dark chocolate or not, depending on their preference, and then we exposed them to a loud noise that caused permanent hearing loss, measured their hearing loss two weeks later. Here's the results. Um, here are mice that did not eat chocolate. Here are the mice that consumed chocolate. They had more hearing loss than the controls. 
<sighs> and the regression analysis that we did showed a, uh, a significant uh, relationship between how much the chocolate they ate and how much hearing loss they got. Hmm. So um, let me end with a few friendly recommendations from your neighborhood auditory neuroscientist. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, so take these with a grain of salt. We have one type of hearing loss that is preventable, and that is noise-induced hearing loss. And so if you can, limit your exposure to noise. If you can't avoid exposure, then wear hearing protection. You don't miss it until it's gone. Second, uh, looks like increasing dietary levels of antioxidants is probably a good idea, but mm, I don't know. There's, there's more to this than meets the eye, and so uh, be aware that some antioxidants can be harmful rather than helpful. And lastly, if you happen to like dark chocolate, may I suggest <laughs> you eat it in a quiet room. <laughs> Thank you.